On November 23, 1992, a Hollywood camera crew were flying over a live volcano, filming scenes for the big-budget Hollywood movie Sliver, starring Sharon Stone, William Baldwin, and Tom Berenger. They were shooting footage of the Pu'u'o'o vent on the Kilauea volcano in Hawaii when they experienced a catastrophic engine failure. They crash land inside the volcano, below the rim of a 600-foot-high crater, next to deadly pools of lava and suffocating toxic gases. The team comprised of celebrated movie photographer Mike Benson, known for his work on movies such as The Blues Brothers, Ghost, and Terminator 2, Chris Duddy, his camera assistant, and experienced pilot Craig Hosking, responsible for flying sequences on movies such as City Slickers, The Rocketeer, Point Break, and Robocop 3. They were a very experienced team. Legend has it that the vent is home to the most powerful of Hawaiian gods, Madam Pele. Local superstition dictates that you pay homage to her by dropping a bottle of gin into the volcano, thus ensuring no harm will come to you. Mike arranged for Chris to take the bottle and would yell when they were in position to throw it in. Unfortunately, the turbulent airflow rising from the volcano caught the bottle, blowing it back out and causing it to miss its mark, smashing at the side. Mike commented that it's okay, she'll get the idea. After a Passover, they landed to examine the footage they had taken, and noticing they only had a few seconds of usable photography, they decided to do another Passover and try again, this time a little lower and faster. It's shortly before noon on Saturday. As the helicopter passes over the crater rim again, it experiences complete engine failure. With the blade deceleration and the beeping of instruments, pilot Craig tells them they're going down. They crash on the hot crater floor, narrowly missing a lava pool and a steam crater. All three men survived with only minor cuts, but were now trapped inside the hot crater with noxious gases being released around them. A thick cloud of VOG, comprising a dangerous mix of carbon dioxide, hydrogen chloride, and sulfur dioxide. About 50 yards from the lava pool, they needed to find air to avoid suffocation. The pilot, Craig Hosking, tries to make a mayday call on the radio, but realizes there's no power since the helicopter's electrical system was destroyed in the crash. He didn't have time to radio for help before, so they were stuck with no rescue inbound. It was beginning to look like climbing out was their only chance of survival. Exploring to the north, they found the air was unbreathable since this was towards the live part of the volcano, turning their attention to climbing the side. As the crew climbed higher, much like a bowl, the climbing angle became steeper and steeper. The volcanic rock was sharp like needles and would easily crumble and break away. Chris got stuck further up the side while Mike and Craig found a small ledge around three foot long and 18 inches wide where the air was slightly better. They realize climbing isn't working and decide their only chance would be to get some power back to the chopper radio. Craig had experience with the electrical systems and decided to return to try and get the radio working again while Mike and Chris stayed put. Upon reaching the crash site, Craig finds the air pretty much unbreathable and has to return to a small cinder hill where he can only catch his breath whenever the wind blew the air in the right way. He eventually finds a camera battery that ran on 24 volts the same as the helicopter's electrical system. Using a pocket knife, Craig cut the end of the battery cable and managed to wire it in and power the helicopter's radio. He started making mayday calls, but getting no oxygen for multiple breaths at a time, Craig had to continuously return to the hill to try and catch a breath before returning to the crash site to try again. Finally, one of his mayday calls is picked up by a passing tourist helicopter who alerts the emergency services. Craig returns to the others with the good news, telling them not to come down because he was unable to breathe. 
After this point, Mike and Chris didn't hear from him again. Craig returns to the crash site and establishes contact with the pilot of the rescue helicopter close by, Don. The VOG is too dense for any visual contact, making an air rescue impossible. So Don helps to coordinate a ground rescue team who can just about make out Craig at the crashed helicopter. After reaching the crater, they shout for Craig to try and reach them because they couldn't get around to the other side, but the route would take Craig closer to the lava pit, making the breathing conditions even worse. Realizing it could be his only chance of rescue, he decided to make a run for it to them. But when he reached that side, they were no longer there and realized the rescuers had to pull back due to the conditions above. He somehow managed to make it back to the crash site and got back on the radio to Don, the rescue pilot. Don could tell Craig was dying and asked if he could get to him, would he have the strength to get on the helicopter? Craig said yes and Don made the life or death decision to attempt the rescue. Don started to lower his helicopter into the VOG with zero visibility and real danger of his own engine failure should the clouds starve his engine of oxygen. Craig frantically calls for Mike and Chris to return to the crash site, but they're unable to hear over the rescue helicopter, who's lowering with visibility of just five to 10 feet. Finally, Craig is able to see Don and manages to make it onto the helicopter before taking off. At this point, as the sound of the helicopter engine fades away into the distance, it appears to Mike and Chris that the rescue has been aborted. Now, seven hours in, it's getting dark. The temperature plummets and Mike and Chris are in danger of suffering hypothermia and dehydration. Their throats were constricting, making it hard to talk. Chris remained on the steep wall about 50 feet from the crevice Mike was in. Finally, they heard rescuers from above. They yelled down that due to the weather conditions above, it was too dangerous to attempt rescue now, but would return in the morning. It was crushing for them to realize that they'd have to try and survive a perilous night inside the volcano. Mike turned his light meter upside down to try and collect water from the weather above. They could hear landslides all around them, fearing that they could get caught up in one at any moment and be taken off the cliff. The next day, 19 hours after the crash, the rescue team battled to reach Mike and Chris. Outside of the microclimate of the cone, the weather was severe. The rescuers had to stay back from the dangerously unstable edge and can't see Mike or Chris, but they can hear them, barely. Then suddenly, a rope drops near Mike, but it's too far away. It drops again about 10 feet away, but jumping for it would result in a deadly fall. The rope appears a third time, about six feet away. Just as Mike is reaching, it pulls up again. The weather above was getting worse, causing a halt to the rescue attempt. After 28 hours in, Chris decided his only chance was to try and climb further to escape. As he looked up, he saw a pathway above that he hadn't noticed before, and it looked pretty promising. About 20 minutes in, Mike yelled asking how far Chris was. He said he was about five feet from the top. Mike then asked him to make sure he yells back once he had made it. Chris, nearing the top, realizes that due to the layer of loose gravel, he can't climb any further, and if he couldn't hold on, he would plummet hundreds of feet into molten lava. Chris ended up digging his arms up to the elbows into the gravel for leverage. He was as sharp as broken glass, cutting his arms up in the process. He then lunged for the top, rolled over, and was out. At this point, he realized how bad the weather conditions were up there and tried yelling down, but knowing Mike would not be able to hear him. Finding the rope the rescuers had used, Chris considered lowering it to rescue Mike, but realized he'd end up killing them both given that he was in shock 
with no energy and all cut up. Instead, he laid the rope down and roughly marked Mike's location. A few hours after Chris left, something that appeared to be the shape of a body came crashing past Mike through the steam and mist. His heart sank at the thought of his friend falling to his death as he hadn't heard from Chris since when he was nearing the top, despite agreeing that he would let him know when he was out. Chris followed some cones near the top back to the rescuers' base camp, but there was nobody there. The weather had forced them to leave. He tried drinking water, but his throat was too swollen, although he did find and use an oxygen mask. He started the five-mile hike back from the volcano, but was luckily spotted by a passing helicopter who picked him up. Chris told the rescuers that Mike was alive, but the extreme weather conditions meant that they couldn't make another rescue attempt that day, meaning Mike faces another night in the volcano. On the second night, Mike thought he was the only survivor. He had resolved himself to death and said that the lava sounded like surf pounding against the shore. It was at this time he claims to have started seeing visions of Madame Pele, the god of the volcano, who he described as having long flowing hair. On day three, after 47 hours in the volcano, Mike hears the sound of a helicopter. After the previous two ground rescue attempts failed, Mike's film company hired another pilot to attempt a radically different aerial rescue. Pilot Tom Hortman managed to spot Mike during a momentary break in the steam and gas of only a few seconds. The helicopter lowered closer and using a speaker told Mike to stay put while they get some equipment. The break in the gas closes up immediately. After about half an hour, they return and a seat made out of netted rope appeared out of the smoke, being lowered roughly where they had seen Mike before. And about 10 feet away, it got lodged on a large rock, which was caught up on the net. The rescue crew thought this was Mike's weight in the basket, so they powered up and left. Shortly after, they returned having removed the rocks and positioned the basket around nine or 10 feet away where Mike saw his chance and jumped. Mike was flown back to base camp where he found to his surprise that both Chris and Craig had actually survived. Mike was admitted to the intensive care unit in a stable condition at Hilo Hospital, suffering from chemical pneumonia, inflammation of the lungs from the sulfur dioxide in the volcano fumes, as well as dehydration and exposure. Since the crash, Craig Hosking continues to fly for major feature films such as Jurassic Park, Speed, Con Air, Pearl Harbor, and The Dark Knight. He is one of the most in-demand pilots in Hollywood. Chris Duddy has become a director and producer. Mike Benson continued to shoot major Hollywood movies after this, such as Species, Rush Hour, and X-Men, and has since earned his own pilot's license. Sliver, the movie they were filming for, was released in May 1993, making $36 million gross in the US and Canada, and over $116 million worldwide on a budget of $40 million. After test screenings, Paramount Pictures decided to change the ending of the film. The footage they were filming for was never used. <laughs>